I've mentioned Rachel a lot lately. Bulletin articles, sermon illustrations, things of that nature. And there's a very good reason for that. Tomorrow she turns 18. Tomorrow she be becomes an adult, quote unquote. Tomorrow she is of legal age. Tuesday she gets to vote for the very first time and she's sort of excited about that, but you just kind of wish there was somebody she could vote for, you know? But uh, anyway, tomorrow she can tell me that I can't use her as sermon illustrations or bulletin articles anymore. Legally. However, if she wants mama and dada to help her with Harding next year, she's not going to say a word. <laughs> right? Okay. Uh, but just in case, I do have one more story to tell. <laughs> about six years ago, Rachel was about to turn 12, and her birthday was on a Sunday. And so I asked her, I said, Rachel, what do you want Daddy to preach on on your birthday? And that's one of the perks of being a preacher's kid. There's an awful lot of bad stuff about being a preacher's kid. I mean, you know, you always have to be, it doesn't matter how tired you are from the night before, you got to be at church on Sunday morning, and all these other bad things. There are some perks to it, though. And that's one of the perks. And when I asked her this, I, I was hoping she would tell me, you know, her favorite Bible story, or maybe some difficult verse that she'd been working on, trying to figure out exactly what it means, and so forth. Well, she said three words. I don't care. Almost with that inflection. I mean, not even a teenager yet. Just about to turn 12 and she's already talking like a teenager, right? Well, it's pretty uh, odd. Once she told me this and everything, uh, uh, there were a couple of weeks in between her birthday and when she told me this. And uh, in, the, in those few weeks, the youth minister at the church where we, uh, we were at to... Uh, had a apathy party. He said he and Kyle he he invited me to come to their apathy party, but said he didn't care if I came or not. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know that I care to come. And uh, he said, well, fine then. And you know, and it was all well and good. And um, I guess those who went had an, had a real apathetic time. I don't know. I hadn't cared enough to ask anybody, even my own daughters that went. I haven't cared enough to ask them how they liked that. But uh, this morning, I want us to look at a church that was apathetic. At a church that, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that, that had a problem with apathy. If you would open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. I know what you're thinking. Some of you anyway. You're thinking, oh, we're going to talk about the lukewarm Laodicean church. No, not exactly. Actually, what I want us to do is talk about Sardis from Revelation 3, verses 1 through 6. You know, apathy can be a very big problem. It can be a problem that uh, causes nations to fall. When we stop caring, we become disinterested in things. Then we get careless. And before we know it, our carelessness has cost us dearly. This morning I want us to begin by looking a little bit at the history of Sardis' apathy. And then I want us to see what they are told is the solution to their apathy. So let's start by looking at the history of apathy in Sardis. 700 years before Revelation was written, Sardis had become one of, if not the, greatest city in the world. It was ruled over by the king of Lydia. It had magnificent, magnificence and, and luxury. They had nearly unlimited wealth in the city. It was a great place to be. It was also a great military power as well. Um, 
Which is really no wonder when you understand that it stood in the midst of a, of a river plain on a plateau some 1,500 feet above the Hermas Valley below. Now you look at this map, this topographical map, and you see where uh, Sardis is right there and a big red arrow pointing to it and all. Uh, if, you, if you look at the, the surrounding uh, countryside, you see it's all mountains. And uh, Sardis was situated on the top of one of those mountains. The, the sides of the plateau were sheer cliffs. In fact, if you look at this map, or this picture, taken not exactly when the city was existing when we're talking about it, but that plateau is, is where the city was. It's changed a little bit in the several millennia since then. But uh, uh, you, you get the idea and you get the picture of... Uh, uh, of, uh, of just how, uh, how, how the city would have been situated. In fact, the city was nearly impregnable. Looking at uh, one sc scholar and historian says, looking at Sardis from a distance was like looking at a gigantic watchtower above the Hermas Valley. Actually, Sardis grew until the plateau was no longer big enough for the city. And so it sort of spilled over into the valley below. Um, now it became a two-tiered or a split-level city. You had Upper Sardis and you had Lower Sardis. Something intriguing about Lower Sardis is that a river that was said to contain gold bisected Lower Sardis. So yes, they were a very wealthy city. Their society, though, was degenerate. As they became more and more comfortable in their life of luxury, as they might have seen it, as they're smug in their self-confidence, they, they thought that their wealth would last forever. But they became soft and flabby. Uh, they, they, they thought it would last forever, but it didn't. In fact, in his haughtiness, the, well, um, their, their, their wealth actually, the greatest king in Sardis was Croesus, who actually was the king when uh, the river containing gold was discovered to contain gold. And uh, he, they, they, they just got wealthier and wealthier. And, uh, in his haughtiness, though, uh, Croesus uh, declared war on uh, Cyrus of Persia, okay? Um, you know, again, their, their wealth made him complacent. It was their downfall. So as he uh, went to uh, declare war on Cyrus, he had to cross the Hales River. So naturally, as any king would do before he went to war, he uh, went to one of the temples of the idols in the city of Sardis, quite possibly a temple to Artemis, who was more uh, famous as Artemis of the Ephesians, but Ephesus wasn't that far away, and it'd be very likely that uh, there would be a temple to Artemis in Sardis as well. But he went to ask one of, consult one of the priests in that temple about what his plan should be and what the outcome would be. He wanted to know if he should go to war, and the priest told him, if you cross the river Hales, you will destroy a great empire. And Croesus was like, yes, that's what I wanted to hear. He took that as good news. He took that as, hey, I can't lose now. It never even entered his mind that the great empire that was going to be destroyed could have been his very own. But you know what? That is exactly what happened Croesus was routed when he crossed the river, but he wasn't too worried about it. He was still alive. He still had, you know, some army left and everything. He simply had to uh, retreat to the citadel of Sardis, recoup, refit, fight again. Cyrus wasn't going to let him do that. Cyrus said, you declare war on me and you're in trouble. And so he laid siege to the city of Sardis. Um, and he waited 14 days. 
and then offered a special reward to any one of his soldiers who could find a way to get into the city. Because like, like you said, it was a, it was a fortress. How were they going to get in there? Uh, Cyrus offered a reward. And one of the soldiers in the army of Cyrus, though, noticed that the composition of the rock on which Sardis stood had cracks and faults in it. One evening as he was watching the uh, soldiers up in the city of Sardis, uh, he noticed that one of them dropped his helmet. And uh, after he, he dropped his helmet, um, the, uh, the, the soldier went to retrieve it and he, he made his way down what appeared to be a crack uh, in, in the wall above. Um, he emerged outside, retrieved his helmet, went back in the same crack, and next thing you know, he was right back up at his post. So this, uh, the, 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 this uh, soldier figured out that there must be a crack in that rock somewhere big enough for a man to, to walk through and, 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 uh, and travel. So the next night, he led a party of Persian troops uh, uh, through the fault in the rock, when they uh, got into the actual city, they found the opening completely unguarded. All of the Sardinian soldiers were asleep. And so under the cover of darkness, he and his men simply went over, opened the city gate for the rest of the Persian army, and the city was uh, defeated in just one night. All because of apathy. Because they didn't care enough. They'd become so lackadaisical. They'd become so, uh, so apathetic that they weren't even keeping watch. But this isn't the end of the story of Sardis, though. The city disappeared from history under Persian rule for two centuries until it fell into the hands of Alexander the Great. Uh, it became a Greek city then. It's said, that, though, that people who fail to learn from the past, are doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past. And, well, let's just say history repeats itself in Sardis. Now, when Alexander the Great died, four of his generals um, were fighting for control over his empire. Ultimately, what they decided was that they would divide the empire into fourths and each general would take a fourth of Alexander's empire. And that worked great except for the fact that the generals, they pretended that they were happy with the fourth, but, you know, they wanted more. And so the uh, general who had uh, received the area, including Sardis, was at war with another of the generals. And uh, for a year, he managed to defend the city against attack. But one night, a band of soldiers crept up the steep cliffs and entered the city through a crack. There was no guard. There was no opposition. And the city had forgotten to learn the lesson of the past. The city fell again that night because they weren't keeping watch. Because they were apathetic. In due time, Sardis became a Roman town. And as a Roman town in the year 17 AD, it was uh, pretty well destroyed by an earthquake. Okay, that'd be about one of the only things that could get to the city of Sardis would be an earthquake. And, and it did, and, and uh, it was destroyed. But uh, Tiberius, the emperor, made Sardis tax-exempt for five years. More than that, he provided funds from the Roman Empire to help rebuild Sardis. And it's no wonder that Sardis recovered in almost record time, we might say. Uh, and they, they, they recovered the very easy way, though. They weren't for, they're allowed not to pay taxes. Central government giving them everything that they needed. It was easy for them to recover. By the time John wrote what Jesus told him to write to Sardis, the city was once again wealthy and once again severely degenerate. Once again, 
The Sardinians had become soft. Once again, they had become apathetic. Twice the city had lost because its inhabitants were too apathetic to keep watch. And once again, an attitude of smug apathy prevailed in the city. Within the city was a church. And unfortunately, the church had taken on some of the characteristics of the city. Unfortunately, the church, the members, they weren't keeping watch. They weren't watching out for false teachings. They weren't watching out for, well, they weren't watching out for anything. It was just a nice place that they would go on the first day of the week and everything was great. It was lazy and apathetic. It was not keeping watch. And it too was in danger of falling. You see, the sin of Sardis was apathy. Apathy is unconcern. Apathy is disinterest. It's carelessness. It's all these things rolled into one, wrapped up together. It can include negligence, indifference, lethargy. Apathy is spiritual numbness that can eventually become spiritual paralysis. If the temperature, it is the temperature lukewarm. Apathy is actually worse than lukewarm. You see, apathy is a compound word. A, meaning without, and pathy, meaning feeling. It literally means without feeling. It has no passion. It has no opinion. Its bywords are, I don't care. I don't want to be bothered. I don't know, and I don't want to know. So how can a person, a city, or a church, escape apathy? What can be done to restore the spiritual vitality that was once pre present? Well, the answer is in our text. The answer is in what Jesus tells the church at Sardis to do. If you would follow along as I read Revelation 3, verses 1 through 6. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have some, but yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot out his name from the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. <coughs> Jesus told the Sardinians five things to do in order to overcome apathy. The solution to, Sardis in, to apathy in Sardis, the first part was to wake up, verse 2 tells us. If you have the King James Version, it says, be watchful. That puts it pretty well, but the original word carried an element of urgency with it. A person can be watchful, and still be asleep or half asleep. Some of you don't believe me. There have been times when I have been seated on our couch in a reclined position watching television. And my sweet, loving wife will come up and she'll turn the TV off. And I'll say, hey, I was watching that. Said, no, you weren't. You were asleep. She's only partially right, though. I may have been dozing, but I was still watching it. I was only half asleep, we might say. That may well describe the condition of the person who is apathetic, watching, but in a stupor so strong that the ability to act is severely diminished. Years ago, I read the story about a a forest ranger, park ranger, who very nearly froze to death. He was at his post when an Arctic front blew in. 
And yet, I've been told that a person who is freezing to death is aware for a while, but they just can't muster the strength to move. A person who is freezing to death, they're aware of what's happening, but they just want to relax. It feels just too good to let go and go to sleep. Even though that person is dying in their condition, they don't care. This is so much like apathy, to know but not care. In a sense, apathy is like quicksand. The longer you're in it, the deeper you're mired. And if you, if you are to survive, you must get out today because tomorrow may be too late. Go against those dull feelings. Wake up and do it now. Secondly, Jesus says to the apathetic, he says, strengthen what remains. Again in verse 2. Apathy can cause you to lose some things that you once had. Notice the actual complete command is strengthen what remains and is about to die. You see, apathy doesn't have to be terminal. It can be terminal if it's not treated, if you don't come out of it. But apathy by itself is not terminal. It can be recovered from. At first, it's just the dulling of your, the fine edge of your zeal for God. Perhaps next to go is your prayer life. You don't want to pray. You don't have time to pray anyway. I mean, if you were to pray for everybody who asked you to pray for them, then it would take you who knows how long, and nobody has that kind of dot time, a dot, that time during their day. You just don't really want to do it anymore. Then your desire for association with other Christians disappears. After all, as the darkness in, within you is growing, it doesn't like to be around the light. You begin to get annoyed when well-meaning folks at church ask how you're doing. You think, is it really necessary for me to attend all of the services of the church? I mean, really, show me in the Bible where it says you've got to go twice on Sunday. Show me in the Bible where it says that they came together on Wednesday night for a midweek service. Just show me that in the Bible. It's not in there. It is in there that they met daily in the book of Acts, just so that you know. But you begin to wonder, do I really have to go to every service? And pretty soon, pretty soon, it's no longer do I have to go to every service, it's I don't want to go today. I just don't feel like it. Since I don't feel like it, it won't do me any good if I go anyway, so I'm just not going to go. And you begin to miss more and more frequently. And then again, those well-meaning people from church, they start asking, well, what's wrong? I'm fine! Leave me alone! Right? Isn't that the way it works? We start to get angry. We start to get upset. Then we start calling them meddlers. Right? Because they're trying to butt in on my private affairs. Whether I go or not, that's my, my business only. The price, of course, is guilt. You're convicted by this, by your conscience and by the Holy Spirit. Your, your response, though, is to rationalize your behavior. Again, it's my business. It's nobody else's business. It's my business. You see, apathy works because of laziness. Satan often will, will, uh, will at this time come up with an offer of something better. Something that in your more alert days you would never even have considered. But now, oh, it, it doesn't seem like it's that wrong. Really. Stop just a moment. You to take stock. Okay? Am I describing you? Has apathy begun to creep into your life? If so, then you better do something today. You better make some moves quickly to conserve and strengthen what remains. It may, after all, be about to die. 
Third, remember what you have received and heard. You know, time away from anything brings forgetfulness and unfamiliarity. Perhaps you took some higher math in school that you haven't used, at least formally used, in many, many years. If you sat down and tried to do it, would you be able to? I can tell you, absolutely not. Okay? Jamie's in geometry. See, I'll let you off the hook, Rach. Jamie's in geometry. And I'm trying to help her with it. I made an A in geometry in high school. I still have to look back in the book to see how to do what she's doing. Actually, sometimes I look in the back of the book to make sure that I get the right answer. Right? But if you don't use it, you lose it. The same is true with, with, with Greek. I mean, I, I took Greek for four semesters in college. Made A's every time. But if you were to set a sentence in Greek in front of me, I wouldn't be able to translate it for nothing without looking up each word individually. But you see, there are memories that can combat apathy. What memories do we need that can combat apathy? You need to remember the real issues of life that brought you to Christ in the first place. There's still a heaven and a hell. There's still sickness and disappointment and aging and death to deal with. There's still a, a need to have guidance in your life that is bigger than your own feeble abilities. But you know, God knows this and He, he hasn't left us without tools to help us remember. God has built remembrance right into the disciplines of the Christian life if we'll just use them. When you and I assemble on Sunday and we take that little piece of unleavened bread and that, uh, that, that little cup of grape juice, we're supposed to be remembering. In our mind's eye, we should picture again the cross of Jesus, the crucifixion, and then ask the question, why? Then we do a little bit of self-examination and we find out the answer to the question why. The answer to the question why is because there's still sin in my life. I haven't quite figured it out yet. Sin that could condemn us for eternity if it weren't for the agony on that cross. Sin that could still condemn us for all of eternity if we lose sight of that cross or just don't care about it anymore. If we're reminded, though, it's harder to become apathetic. My friends, is apathy heart slowly hardening like cement around our feet? Have we neglected the basic uh, spiritual disciplines? You say, nope, not me. I take communion all the time, every day, first day of the week. I'm here. I take communion. That's great. You take communion, but have you stopped remembering? Because if you stopped remembering, you've probably stopped the self-examination. And if you stopped the self-examination, then communion is simply a meaningless ritual. Have you forgotten to do these things? Don't wait for it to happen. Unless you take specific steps right now, the sooner the better. Apathy can claim you back for the devil. So fourthly, Jesus says, not only are we to remember what we received and heard, but we are to keep it. To keep it. Keep what? Keep the, what the things that we have received and we've heard. You keep it by obeying it. In fact, some versions have the word, words obey it in, instead of keep it. Uh, we, but we keep it. When you buy a car that you intend on keeping for a long time, how do you treat it? Do you neglect it? Do you figure, well, you know what? I'm just going to drive it till it falls apart. No. You change the oil in it. You, you get it, wash it and you, you keep it, air in the tires and so forth. You take care of it. You spend all the time that is necessary to maintain it because you've got an awful lot invested in that car. You don't let it slip into disrepair. Because you know that you're going to keep it. 
And if you're going to keep it, those things have to be done. You don't just talk about doing it either. You don't just buy a manual on car uh, upkeep and repair and you put it up on the bookshelf and it's a heavy enough book that every once in a while you pull it down and you press a flower in it. No. This is the way that it works. You do what is necessary. Brings up an interesting point about hearing and doing. James associates forgetting with not doing. James 1, 22 through 25, James writes, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So let me ask you, when is your doing done? If you come here on Sunday just to watch the preacher work as he goes through his paces, you're not doing. You're just hearing. And soon you'll be just forgetting and not acting and not keeping. Incidentally, that word keep or obey in the original language in verse 3 is in what's known as the continuous present tense. The idea is that you start and you never stop. You keep on doing it. You keep on keeping it. You keep on obeying it. Do you leave here on Sunday feeling like your doing is done? Made it through one more church service. Not, don't have to come back and do anything else till next week. Is that how you feel? Or do you leave here feeling like your doing is just beginning? You see, how you answer that question says a lot about how strong of a hold apathy has on you. It tells a lot about whether you are a deluded hearer or a doer. You see, we live in a mission field, okay? We need to be about the work of missionaries. Do you want to know why some of us become apathetic about church? It's because we never engage the enemy. I mean, think about this, okay? If you are playing a sport, okay, and you go to practice, you go to practice, you go to practice, and finally one day you ask the coach, coach, when's our first game And the he or she looks at you and says, game? We don't need a game. We're just going to practice. There's no game. How many of you would stay on the team? No. You practice and then you play a game. The same is true. Uh, with a, imagine a soldier who never engages the enemy. I mean, he drills and drills and drills until he's bored stiff. He marches. His, his medals have a great shine to him because he shines them every day and he, he, he goes in the barracks and he cleans the barracks and he says, yes, sir, a hundred times a day. Only one thing he doesn't do. He doesn't fight. He never feels the sheer terror of the battle that makes him realize what all that training is really about. That's where some of us are. That's where some of us have been for a very long time. And so we come up with the idea, well, church is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. I can go, not go. It doesn't really matter. Those who feel that way feel that way because they're not in the battle. They're just sitting around in the barracks thinking that there's nothing to do so that their training has no purpose. So from their perspective, church is irrelevant. Listen to me. If you want to energize your faith and your life, figure out some ground, a soul, that Satan owns, and then begin to try to do something about that, to take that soul for Christ. I guarantee you that after you have experienced and ducked that hail of bullets that comes your way because you had the audacity to enter the territory of Satan, your apathy will vanish and church will become meaningful and very relevant. Finally, Jesus says, 
repent. In every course correction, there is a point of turning. A point where you grab the wheel and you turn things around. And repentance is that turning point. In the Greek, the word repent is in the aorist imperative tense. It describes a determined, definite point of action. It is a point of action. It is an hour of decision. Repentance is the act, the determination to change. It's not deciding that you need to change. It's actually making the course correction. You see, sometimes we, we think that we've repented if we agree with what the preacher says. That's not repentance. Let me tell you a secret. Satan agrees with everything that I've said this morning. Satan agrees with what Jesus tells the church in Sardis to do about their apathy. He agrees with it 100% because he knows that that's what you need to do. The difference is he doesn't want you to do it. He doesn't want you to make that course correction. He believes it to be true. He believes it's in your best interest. But he doesn't care what's in your best interest, okay? Satan is apathetic towards you. Isn't it funny how so many of us choose to listen to him instead of to God, who cares so deeply about you that he sent his son to die on the cross for you. But you see, that's why Satan's working so hard at this moment to keep you and to keep me from doing anything about it. Will we let him stroke our apathy? Will we let him continue to lull us to sleep? And some would say, well, I don't want to. Such words are spoken in the true form of an apathetic person. Remember, apathy is without feeling. Sometimes you have to do things that at the moment you just don't feel like doing. Tomorrow morning, there's going to be an annoying sound that disturbs your slumber. And you have to make a choice. Am I going to get up and go to work or am I going to stay in the nice warm bed? You choose to go to work, don't you? You don't want to do it. You'd rather do, stay in your, own, your, in your nice warm bed. But if you make the choice to get up and go to work, then come payday, you're going to be glad that you did, right? Because choices have consequences. Do you want to know what the solution to apathy in Siloam Springs is? Exactly the same thing. Wake up. Strengthen what remains. Remember, keep it, and repent. Remember, um, Dr. Lawrence M. Gould, President Emeritus of Car Carleton College, once said in a speech, I do not believe the greatest threat to our future is from bombs and missiles. I don't think our civilization will end that way. I think it will, that it will die when we no longer care. You know, the same can be said for the church. My friends, let's not get caught unaware or unprepared. Let's shake off the apathy right now. In fact, Jesus tells the lukewarm congregation of Laodicea in Revelation 3, verses 19 and 20, Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him. And he with me. Is he knocking on the door of your heart? If he is, don't be apathetic. Don't feel like you can always make things right later. Don't say, well, you know what? The preacher went over. Nobody wants to stay around any longer to hear about my needs. Want to bet? They do. They do because they're your family. They do because they're concerned and because they care about and they care for you. Don't leave here apathetic. If we can help you in some way through a public response, won't you make that response right now by coming to the front as we stand and sing together?